Go, greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore. Well, today, I'm gonna do a return to a old pseudo series I did years ago, theorycrafting how the various factions might carry out planetary invasions and large military operations. And today, we're gonna look at how the orcs might plan a military invasion of an entire planet. Now, I know what you're thinking, do orcs even have tactics, much less interplanetary ones? Granted, the star-faring greenskins are not the most enormous fans of codified strategic doctrine, yet if one digs deep and hard enough with a large enough magnifying glass, it is possible to discern the vague outlines of a plan. An accidental one most of the time, to be sure, but a plan nevertheless. But first, you know who it is? Our beloved sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. The biggest and the bestest PvE and PvP mobile game on the market with hundreds of champions, thousands of skills, and endless challenge. Today, I'm going to show you some awesome champions, and there will be a link in the description below as well as a QR code on screen right now. Without further ado, let me present Turvold. A legendary champion for the Barbarians faction, there is nothing subtle about this man mountain. A one-man fighting machine capable of dishing out some of the highest damage in the game with stealth buffs to attack, critical hit chance, and speed. And if that still isn't enough, he can also place a weakened debuff on the entire enemy team to soften them up for the hard bonkings. Pure, unadulterated damage makes Torvald a top-tier choice for any content. And for anything you can't out-damage, simply out-heal it with Minea. Hailing from the Bannerlords faction, this pretty little lass comes chock-full of HP-restoring goodness. She heals herself, she heals your weakest champions, and hell, she simply just heals everyone at once. And nobody ever hates on a good healer. Finally, we are headed to the frozen north for Gurgo, the Ogre. Just like his homeland, this Ogre spellcaster is all about disabling his enemies with blood-freezing frost. Capable of encasing the entire enemy team in blocks of ice, he then moves in for the kill with double attacks against all iced-out enemies. He is so cool, in fact, that when he gets hit, he automatically freezes the attacker, so long as they did 20% damage to him or more. Right now, I am enjoying the Faction Wars content, a special mode where every faction has their own set of challenging dungeons that rotate out on a daily basis. You can raid these for valuable crafting materials for epic gear to take down the toughest of endgame content. It is time to sign up, so go to the link in the description below or scan the QR code on the screen to get a bundle of free resources and a mystery champion to breeze you through the early game. Bear in mind, these rewards are for new players only, and when you are in the game, you can find all of these rewards right here in your inbox. Now then, Orc Planetary Invasion Strategies and Tactics. I think we're gonna go with two different approaches here. We're gonna talk about a traditional orc invasion, a simple wag led by a local warlord on the up and up, and then we'll talk a bit about Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka's invasion of Armageddon, one of the best known examples we have of a major and well organized orc invasion on a well defended world. I do have the War for Armageddon series, though it is rather old now. It is absolutely true that uh, the longer a creator keeps doing something, the more he grows to hate the things he has previously made. Yet, nevertheless, it does go into a fair bit more detail about the wider picture of the invasion, whilst today we're going to focus on Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka's way of doing things. We're going to do these two because they are very different. Like night and day, really. You'll see what I mean. We'll start with the more feral orc invasion. 
misunderstand me correctly, by the way. When I say feral, I refer more to the level of sophistication involved, uh, uh, rather than them being actual feral orcs. At the point where a single tribe has become so dominant that they're able to take their wag off world, they're obviously far beyond the level of mere feral orcs, although there is every chance that several tribes of feral orcs have been brought along for the ride. As at this early point, our aspiring interstellar conquering warlord will probably just have grabbed anything and everything he could from his original home world and brought it up into space aboard a fleet of dangerously ramshackable warships. On the bright side, the majority of them will be able to make it off-world and into space without exploding, disintegrating, burning up, or otherwise having some form of catastrophic malfunction that will scatter the orcs that were once inside, outside, and across a vast area of landscape. Because here's the cool thing about orcs that grow naturally on a world, as their society Okay, that might be stretching the word society a bit. As their dominance over the planet grows and grows and grows, the orcs as a species are naturally programmed to begin spawning more specialized individuals. A small tribe is very unlikely to have any specialized orcs whatsoever. No weird boys, no docks or pain boys, and certainly no mechs. But as the tribe grows larger, more successful, more violent, and conquers more nearby tribes, the tribe's needs increase. It might start with a weird boy, for example, to receive visions from Gork and Mork and declare a proper wag to take over the entire planet, followed up by pain boys or full-on docks to make sure that the fighting orcs are kept in tip-top shape. This in return increases the survivability of the little borkies, resulting in bigger boys. Knobs and war bosses begin emerging. And finally, as the tribe is launching massive continent spanning campaigns, the need for motorization and mechanization becomes apparent, and thus, of course, the mech boys begin appearing. Of course, there are a handful of steps in between combustion engine and interstellar spaceship, but <laughs> details, details, especially to the orcs. Once a tribe finally reaches this august point, they will have plenty of mechs to make plenty of attempts, and some of them will even be pretty good ones. That will see our newly created orc empire begin to expand beyond the borders of its initial solar system. But as it turns out, getting off a planet and getting safely back onto the planet are not necessarily the same thing at all. And so the very first planetary invasion launched by our more feral warlord is likely to simply be all of the available starships crashing into the planet in question. <laughs> Fortunately, the warships themselves are designed with a degree of robustness in mind, and the orcs themselves too are not exactly strangers to the occasional heavy hit on the head, so a frighteningly large percentage of them will survive their abrupt arrival. Their hardware might be uh, another question. Bikes, trucks, and stuff like that. Uh, Gargants, if they're super advanced, will probably respond more poorly to impacting the ground at a couple hundred kilometers per hour whilst trapped inside an enormous steel coffin. Fortunately, the mech boys are aware of the uh, impact damages, and will more often than not be able to immediately scavenge replacement parts from nearby civilized settlements to replace anything lost in the descent. And this is usually the first part of any more um, amateurish orc invasion. The more uh, truly cunning warlords might be so intelligent as to pick a landing spot ahead of time and attempt to ensure that the majority of his warships crash in the same general area. This is far from guaranteed, but it has happened previously. You must understand, this isn't necessarily pure idiocy. 
in part it is pure idiocy, but it's also the simple fact that the Warlord has never carried out any kind of an operation quite like this, and there isn't exactly a Warpedia to teach them any of this stuff. And if the Warlord survives, and even better, is successful in his raid, then he will learn the lesson that next time, maybe he should ask his mechs to figure out some way of, uh guiding the descent of the dropships, quote-unquote, maybe. But that is a problem for next time. Right now, the planetary invasion is already full steam ahead. Obviously, the first objective, due to the unfortunate nature of the orcs' entrance into this poor little planet's atmosphere, the first and foremost objective needs to be to rally the boys once more, figuring out where everybody is and who's got the good toys, the big guns, the trucks, the mechs, the weird boys, and the pain boys, to ensure that the campaign continues as smoothly as possible. Though to be entirely honest with you, uh, smooth is probably the very last thing that this invasion is ever going to be for either party. The defenders, let's assume Imperial because they're the easiest, are probably panicking like nobody's business right now as a bunch of enormous spaceships just fell out of orbit and scattered wildly all across their planet. Many PDF officers are right now screaming at the top of their lungs whilst running around in little circles like headless chickens. On the Orc side, one out of two scenarios is currently playing out. Either this is one of those few, rare, and exceedingly dangerous Orc Warlords that realizes that he needs to do something quick to get a grasp of the situation, or He's the far more common type of Orc Warlord, the one that doesn't really know what he's doing, but he's been very successful so far by simply screaming very loudly at anything that stands in front of him, and isn't intending to change anything now. We'll, uh, we'll talk about the, uh, the genius Orc Warlord more properly when we get to Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka. For now, let us again assume a Warlord with more enthusiasm than sense. He's going to have a generalized idea of the campaign, even if he's the enthusiastic sort, but it'll be more along the lines of big amount of humans over there, big amounts of armed humans over there, go fight those things. Essentially, he'll home in on the largest center of resistance and then he'll throw himself and his boys directly at it, which you'd be surprised how often that actually works out. If you're up against an opponent who is technically more capable than you, more skilled uh, in any sort of uh, video game is a perfect example of this, right? If you're up against somebody who knows the game better than you, simply bum rushing the bastard is probably your best chance of beating him, as you're not going to win a drawn out game. You're not going to beat a StarCraft Pro by playing the meta, the regular mechanical game, because he's better than you at it. He's been doing it for longer, and he has a lot more practice. In the case of the Imperial Guard, or more likely local PDF, that'll still be true. They'll have more training coordinating and fighting on a large scale than the Orcs do, because the Orcs have no training in these regards. They've got a great deal of instinct, sure, but as a certain captain of the Night Lords once said, whilst discipline may be boring, it is also undeniably effective. The longer the war drags on, the lesser the Orcs' advantage will become. If the Orcs lose the first major engagement against the largest concentration of local PDF the Warlord can find, the planetary conquest part of the campaign is essentially already over. Now comes 40 decades worth of slowly but surely killing every last single orc on the planet whilst burning out enormous forests of orcoid funguses. Because even if you beat the orcs, the way they interact with the natural environment and begin spreading their spores means that even if they are no longer an overt military threat, you still need an extensive and massive campaign of extermination to actually clear the planet of it, and in some cases, like the equatorial jungle on Armageddon for example, they'll never get rid of all the orcs. 
However, let's say that the Orc Warlord manages to pull off the first fight. He manages to establish himself on one continent, or at the very least one sizable portion of the planet. He has secured his position, he has managed to fortify his base camps, which will happen by itself. It's not like the orcs will go, right, well, we crashed here, so best start building stuff around it. No, it'll just simply be a natural effect of having large amounts of orcs in any given area. They'll begin building little huts, little watchtowers, little areas of territory, little series of walls, and so on and so on. On, and this will be expanded upon over time as the orcs begin <laughs> in fighting. <laughs> uh, I mean, so long as defenses are being built, the precise reason why is immaterial, I do suppose. Uh, the wider campaign, however, is still going to be more or less a question of whatever the Warlord figures is best at that point in time. Though having engaged the enemy for the first time, he's probably now beginning to learn what fighting a non-Orcish opponent is like. They're gonna be fighting, um rather unfairly in many regards. Massed artillery, maybe even some air support, though this is very rare when it comes to PDF forces. And the Orc Warlord will begin responding in kind. For example, if he's up against a lot of armor, you'll see the Orcs starting to field more and more looted tanks or up-armored and up-gunned battle wagons to even the playing field. If they're up against a lot of artillery, they'll begin producing their own artillery. If they're met with aerial resistance, the orcs will begin producing their own aerial assets, and so on and so on. This is another aspect of the orcs growing through battle and warfare, not merely in the physical sense of growing actually larger, getting more knobs or bigger and stronger warlords, but also evolving the way in which they fight. The mech boys will have uh, schematics essentially unlocked in their happy little minds as they see enemy hardware. Oh, that's pretty cool! They Put a giant cannon on the back of a truck, and now you have a self-propelled artillery gun. Yay, that's a great idea, let's start doing that. And whilst for us measly humans it takes years to develop any sort of new weapon systems, that's another beauty of the orc specialized psychology and the effect they have upon the warp. Orc vehicles should not function mechanically, Technically, physically, no matter how you look at it, orc vehicles should not be able to go anywhere at any kind of speed without shaking themselves to pieces and crumbling together in a pathetic heap. Yet, the more orcs you've got together, the more ridiculous violations of the laws of physics begin occurring, until eventually you've got gargants, which should be collapsing underneath their own weight, in much the same way that Imperial Titans should, but in those cases they have various technological devices to prevent this, and the orcs do the same thing, except for them it is the psychological effect of the warg power rather than mere technology. Have I covered this before? I don't know if I have. Have I talked about orc engineering before? See, I've been doing this for so long now, I don't even know which topics I've covered anymore, but briefly put, let me know if I haven't by the way, because in that case I do need to do it at some point down in the comment section below, but brief, 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 brief idea is that the orcs all have a psychic presence in the warp. They are all extraordinarily low-level latent psychers in a way. Now one orc is not psychically active, two orcs isn't psychically active, and even if you've got 10,000 of them, they're not suddenly going to be psychers, but the energy that they affect on the warp just by being orcs and having their mindset means that they begin shaping the world around them, resulting in vehicles that shouldn't work suddenly working, or resulting in blue paint actually providing protection against bullets. Anywho, as all of this is going on, the Warlord will also begin picking up more tricks when it comes to maneuvering and positioning his forces. The first time he falls into an ambush, he's gonna think to himself, well, that was pretty effective. Maybe I can do something similar. Same with the first time he gets exposed to an artillery branch followed by a blitz of infantry and armor. Or the first time he runs into the Imperial Guard and sees armor operate alongside infantry supported by artillery covered by anti-air guns. 
Every little bit of this experience accumulates into his mind and grows more sophisticated over time, until our once rather noobish warlord will begin employing his own crude yet undeniably similar version of the Imperial Guard tactics. They will begin aping the approaches of their enemies. It would actually be really fascinating to see what would happen if the orcs were to fight the Tau for a long enough period of time. I I seem to remember a mention of a Tau versus Orc conflict where the orcs started using ridiculous numbers of flash gits, but my mind can't quite bring up the context here, so it's entirely possible I'm simply imagining this. Yet, yeah, nevertheless, it would be the logical conclusion. Okay, a bunch of blue cowards over there shooting us to pieces whenever we pop our heads out of cover, right? Well, shoot them right back then, or simply dig them out of cover with overwhelming firepower. All of this and more will eventually come to a orc war zone near you. If our orc warlord manages to survive for long enough to put the defenders on the proper defensive, or doesn't simply overrun them immediately, he is also going to begin learning various lessons when it comes to siege warfare, attacking enemy strong points, perhaps even hive cities, and he'll begin learning more about logistics as well. As orcs are rather rough and tough combatants, they can live off the land in all but the most extreme of circumstances, yet Things like ammunition and fuel still needs to be procured from other areas. I imagine real line orc logistics is fascinating. How do they drill for oil? How do they make more ammunition? How do they procure spare parts? Is there any standardization at all? Or does every single vehicle have to be maintained by a specialized mech? I imagine that would play some pretty goddamn severe strains on the logistical department, frankly. <laughs> For the most part, they do tend to use slaves, we do know that. We know of orcs taking human slaves and forcing them to work in uh, manufactorums. We even know ex of examples where they've basically been turned around, put back in the jobs that they were already doing, but now producing the crude orc ammunition, or alternatively the orcs adapting their own weaponry to fit whatever is at hand, be it small arms or a more uh, girthy calibers. This also in turn means that the world itself actually shapes and changes the orcs. This is why I've been talking mostly about um, the orcs' perception of the war and their reaction to it, rather than the more usual where I talk about what kind of strategies or tactics they might employ, because frankly, it depends entirely on the planet. If the orcs arrive on a um, large agri world, for example, a fairly important one which has some Imperial Guard and some PDF forces, mostly mechanized and armored, in which case you are going to see large rolling planes, massed armored engagements, long range artillery, and tanks sniping at each other over kilometers distance. In this case, the Orc Warlord, presuming he isn't swept from the field on day one, will also begin employing huge quantities of armor. He'll begin using more Orc boys mounted in trucks. He'll begin using more looted tanks, more battle wagons, maybe even gargants, and so on. Whereas if he lands on a planet that is almost entirely feral, or covered in enormous quantities of woods or swamps or other dense and difficult terrain, the trucks and the armor will barely be seen at all. Instead, you'll be seeing far more in the way of infantry combat. The orc boys might specialize for more close quarters combat. You might be seeing more tank busters with bombs. You might be seeing more um, more engineering style weapons, almost like enormous bundles of grenades being used to break open positions at close range. You might be seeing more flamethrowers or mortars and heavy weaponry that's able to be moved by regular troops, flash kits, for example, or mechs using their wide array of experimental and relative orc mobile weaponry. And of course, the strategies and tactics will change based upon the 
terrain and the nature of the orcs. This also does come with a little bit of a caveat, however. Once an orc horde is shaped by the environment of sufficient numbers of planets, or one particularly long war on one particular planet, it tends to be difficult for them to readjust themselves to fight a war in a different way. At the very least, it can tend to take quite a lot of time, as the orcs are essentially set back to zero and need to completely relearn how to do warfare. If the mechanized horde arrives on a death world is going to take them a very long time to rework their strategies, the same as the death world orcs arriving on an agri world and vice versa, etc, etc. Nevertheless, I need to revisit here a topic that I've uh, brought up previously when it comes to how orcs like to fight, and this is where we're going to move on a little bit to Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka, where we can look at the more sophisticated versions of orc tactics and strategy. Gazgul has been around for a very, very, very long time, and has learned a great deal of tricks of the trade. He is not only able to carry out combined arms operations, he also has the ability to employ a huge quantity of specialists. Everything from speed freaks pushing forward armored columns, to commandos carrying out raids and ambush tactics, to huge hordes of orcs laying siege to hive cities with sheer mass of assault weight of numbers. He's even started learning about deep strike drop pod tactics after that um, unfortunate debacle during the Armageddon conflict. The most obvious uh, deviation from our previous Warlord's example is when it comes to actually invading the planet. Now, medium level sophisticated Warlords will begin to figure out that it's far more beneficial to keep most of the ships in actual orbit, and then begin shuttling down Orcs via dropships or transport or some other form like giant teleporters, for example. Now this kind of warfare is immediately far more complex as you've added yet another layer to the overall considerations. <laughs> I imagine the first time the Orc Warlord tries this, he might park his ships right above the enemy's anti-ship batteries, for example, and wonder to himself, hold on, I was pretty sure this was supposed to work. Why are all my warships turning into enormous balls of fire like I tried the last time? He might even then decide to give up on the whole thing and simply crash his warships into the planets yet again. But Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka devised a very different approach during the invasion of Armageddon, where he used so called rocks to create bases on the surface. Now, a rock is usually a um, spaceship term for the orcs, where they come across a particularly large or um, auspiciously shaped meteor or asteroid, and they turn it into a rock. Essentially, they just hollow the damn thing out, bolt armor and engines onto it along with as many weapons as they can power, and voila, you've got a warship of sorts. The biggest and most complex of these even boast rudimentary warp drives. They're not great, they can't travel at enormous speeds, and they tend to be a hint unreliable, yet nevertheless, a literal asteroid with guns on it is a pretty damn powerful capital warship, as it is essentially, well, a literal space station that moves and fights and fires. Gazgul thought to himself that, well, these are excellent bases for space operations, as I can host a whole heck of a lot of fighter bombers and other lesser crafts inside of them, but what if I were to simply land one of these on a planet? Well, now I've got a huge, ready-made, armed and armored fortress on the face of the world that can also carry hundreds of thousands of orc boys straight down onto the surface. Better yet, it also provides me with a ready-made logistical center. We've got mech repair shops, we've got little houses to keep the weird boys in when they aren't freaking out, we can build entire clinics, quote-unquote, for the pain boys, not to mention centers of command and control. Better yet, 
We can even take it one step further. Due to Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka being in possession of the orc genius Orchimedes, he is also literally swimming in teleporter technology, so that Gazgul's rocks all had at their core huge teleporter chambers, allowing him to bring in fresh reinforcements from orbit whenever and wherever he wanted, along with logistical supplies. It also allowed him to rapidly redeploy his orcs to wherever he needed. Alright, nothing is happening on this front, so take all of the orc boys you can get, gather them all up, hurdle them into the teleporter, and boom bang bing bang, now they're on the other side of the planet ready to counterattack that nasty imperial offensive. This also allows Gazgul to let his warlords fight on their preferred ground too. Since Gazgul is intelligent enough to actually understand the terrain and survey it beforehand, he can then land and move the rocks and the troops to wherever they will fight the best. Instead of having the orc commando boy mobs getting blasted apart over the wide open terrain of an agri world or agri fields, he can send the armored elements to those areas instead of having to force them into siege warfare against enormous hive cities where they'll get constantly destroyed at point blank range by various teams of Imperial Guard fighting forces. The obvious advantage as well is that the orcs that have learned to fight in a certain way tend to get rather good at fighting in that way, and so can be relied upon far more frequently to actually do something worthwhile. It also lets Gazgul take the concept of deep operations one step further again. I've talked about deep operations in relation to the orcs a couple time previously because well, it's naturally the kind of warfare that works the best for the orcs. It lends itself very well to their form of instincts and uh, reckless warfare. But when you add on the ability to literally dump entire bases with troops and support behind the enemy's lines, you pretty much perfected it. Incidentally, let me go over that idea once more time, because it has been probably years since I've talked about it at this point. The idea of deep operations is something that was originally invented by a, I was about to say, Soviet general there. Well, technically Soviet general in a way. God, this is already getting awfully complicated. Anywho, the Russians decided that they wanted to have themselves a little bit of a civil war, because, you know, various reasons that had a lot to do with the Tsar and Germany and stuff and stuff and stuff and stuff. And one of the officers in the Tsarist army was a man by the name of Mikhail Tukhachevsky. He, despite being of noble birth, decided to join in with the Reds and become one of their leading generals. In fact, he was a bit of a military genius and an absolute revolutionary for the time. He was one of the first major generals that realized the usage and the effect of large mobile semi-armored forces. In fact, one of his greatest success during the Russian Civil War and the following Polish campaign campaign was his armoured cavalry formations. One of the reasons why Poland was able to defeat the Soviet Union, by the way, was because a certain Georgian officer, an NKVD officer at the time by the name of Josef Stalin, was not very happy with Tukhachevsky and refused to hand over his um, uh, mobile armoured cavalry to him for the Polish campaign, and when they were finally sent over, they were so broken down and exhausted that they had no chance of turning the tide, but we're wandering far too much into historical territory now, so let me get back to the orc point again. The basic idea of deep operations can be divided into three stages. The first, you simply mount a massive escalade along the entirety of the front line, or as much of the front line as you possibly can, bearing in mind your resources. This will be done almost exclusively by 
well, the chaff, to be rather blunt with you here. The infantry forces. They are expected to die in absolute goddamn droves, but the rate at which they are dying will give valuable information to the commanders, who will, over the course of the following days, figure out where the enemy is strongest and where the enemy is weakest. Then, the mechanized and the armored forces, which will have been kept in reserve, will be moved against the areas that are considered to be the weakest. This will also be put under a great deal of secrecy, the Russian idea of Maskarovka, though I doubt the orcs would be quite so uh, <clears throat> skilled at that part, so we can skip right over it. And then the third part, you take all of that armor, all of that mechanized infantry, all of those motorized forces, and you slam them through the enemy lines and have them simply run amok as deep, as long, and as far behind the enemy as possible, primarily targeting logistics, trucks, supply depots, and command and control areas, headquarters, general staffs, etc. The idea is to simply rush past the enemy army, ignore as much of the fighting men as possible, and crush what is behind them, crush their backbone, and then continue driving straight to their centers of civilization, straight to their cities, and straight to their headquarters. There was even a um, one of the ideas... Oh, God damn it, I'm gonna... No, 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 I refuse to wander off on a historical anecdote. No, I refuse. Right. <laughs> so, for the orcs, you can see how this might be very effective. Oh, and by the way, it does differ considerably from the German idea of Schwerpunkt, because no, 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 no. <clears throat> Back to the orcs. This functions beautifully for the orcs, and it functions naturally as well. Chaff? Oh, the orcs have a lot of that. Ridiculous quantities of silly little foot-slogging greenskins that can simply be ordered to march towards the enemy and die in absolutely hilarious numbers, and it will provide absolutely no problems to the overall campaign whatsoever. Especially not to a warlord like Gazgul Maguruk Thraka. As they are dying, Gazgul can chill in orbit or in one of his rock bases and go, right, well, they're dying slightly slower over here, so this is where I'm gonna send my biggest and baddest boys, my knobs and my most skilled warlords, and all of course, the speed freaks, to slam on through. And once they're through the enemy's lines, Gazgul don't need to do no more. And here's the thing too, this is the beauty of it. Controlling an orc offensive? Herding cats is not an adequate example here. Um, herding cats already covered in Vaseline and then frightened by many, many loud noises after having been freshly taken out of a dryer into which you also have the Vaseline, and then trying to get the cats to move in an orderly fashion. That's probably more correct, I think. So any hope of then contacting the various warlord and go like, Gazgul 3, son, junior, person, or whatever, I couldn't come up with the name in time, you need to stop whatever you're doing and head towards this strategic objective. Best case scenario, you will be met by an orc's best impression of a goblin. Uh, she not here right now, call again later. Or, more likely, you'll simply ghost your phone calls. And even if by some enormous green-skinned miracle, Gazgol managed to remain in control of his spearhead past the first enemy line, that isn't going to happen when they start running into reservists, running into headquarters, or small areas of resistance. The orcs will just do whatever they want to do at that point, and for deep operations, that's fine, since chaos and confusion behind the enemy is the entire purpose of it. It is to cause a great deal of confusion, and it is to scare the enemy. Oh god, oh god, what do I do? Do I hold my positions? But if I do, can I get surrounded? If I do that, I'll be trapped and I'll be murdered. No, no, it's probably best to retreat, and then you can begin pulling back, opening up other areas for the orcs to break through other points of the front line. Ideally, you will then have multiple arrowheads causing all kinds of havoc behind a fleeing enemy trying to retreat whilst constantly worrying, oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god, where are the orcs, where are the orcs, are they in front of me, are they behind me, are they to my left, are they to my right, is the war already lost, maybe we should just give up and scatter across the countryside. 
When it works, it's a very, very effective strategy. But it does require a very specific kind of user. It requires a... Uh, <laughs> A large amount of chaff, a large amount of armor, a large amount of mechanized troops, and um, commanders willing to take um, individual initiative. Yes, let's put it like that. It sounds far more professional than berserk rampage, frankly. But again, it is effective. As we could see during the invasion of Armageddon again, the first orc invasion in this case, where the Armageddon Steel Legion had been ordered out to assume defensive positions to defeat the invading orcs. The Armageddon Steel Legion's bulk might very well have been destroyed in a single engagement as the orcs overran them and started pouring through their positions, were it not for the heroic sacrifice of Princeps Mannheim of the Legio Metallica, who marched his own titan straight into the heart of the Greenskin Horde and detonated its reactor, delivering a nuclear hammer blow straight to the face of the Orc Offensive. This setback, incidentally, was one of the reasons why the next time Gazgul decided to revisit Armageddon, he chose to not uh, clump up his forces quite so much as last time, and instead chose to engage the Steel Legion in several smaller fights and straight-up siege warfare, but the odds of a single titan violating 75% of his army was considerably lessened. Damn it, but I am half tempted to revisit the war for Armageddon at some point. There is a lot of cool stuff still in that conflict, but uh, I'll put a lid on that for now. So, as you can probably see by now, all tactics and strategy when it comes to invading a planet can be remarkably diverse. In the case of Gazgul Mug Uruk Thraka, the height of orc sophistication, you can have ready-made bases falling out of orbit directly down onto the planet, ready to disgorge entire hordes of greenskins with all of the ammunition, supplies, logistics, and repair facilities required to keep each individual group of warbands operating near indefinitely, along with the ability to continuously reinforce these ready-made strong points points directly onto the surface. Whilst in the case of a more enthusiastic warlord, well, the basic idea is still the same. Create an area of operations and control, a base building and a fortified fallback position. Except in that case, it is literally just the warship itself crashed into the planet's surface. The next stage, too, is somewhat similar. You move out and you find the enemy and you attempt to destroy him as quickly as possible. It's just that Gazgul's approach has a much greater chance of actually succeeding as he employs, well, strategies and tactics and knows what his enemy is up to, whereas the more enthusiastic warboss is probably doing all of this for the very goddamn first time and is going to have to learn every lesson, the slow and painful way through good old-fashioned experience. Though, theoretically, there is nothing stopping any Orc Warlord from becoming a Gazgul mag Uruk Thraka. But fortunately for the Imperium, the overwhelming majority of up-and-coming warbosses are killed in the process of learning their many expensive lessons long before they get even within 17 football fields of the great green-skinned hope. Luckily. It is not a gentle way of waging war, and it is not one that promises much in the way of survival, but it can on occasion work. Don't, by the way, remind me of the Beast series thing. Ah, oh, goddammit. Fucking Primark Hawks. I swear to god. And no, we will never talk about the strategies or the tactics employed by Primarch Orcs, because god damn I hated that series. Don't get me wrong, the first three books was cool, the underlying idea was kinda charming, but gosh, yeah. No, no, not getting into it, just like with the history. I'm gonna wrap it up there before I wander off on a completely unrelated rant. Until next time, I have been Arch, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day, and by the god emperor, now I actually am tempted to do a complete breakdown 
of the beast rises and every single mistake and idiotic idea within it. God help me.